Hi, this is Dr. Scott Oliver. I'm an orthopedic surgeon at BID Plymouth. And I'd like to show you a total knee replacement done with a robotic technology. This is how we start. This is a CT scan of the patient of a right knee. What we're determining is how the prosthesis itself will be sitting on the patient's knee. We have different sizes, and I'm working now with the MPS or Mako product specialist to ensure that we have the prosthesis in the perfect position. What we are looking at is the alignment, the bony resections that will be achieved during the procedure. We're looking out right now at the top of the shin bone, the tibia. making sure that the prosthesis will be sitting on a solid bone. Now we're looking from the top down on top of the tibia. There's some bone spurs here which will be taken off. The prosthesis should not sit on the bone spurs. Now lastly we're looking at the side view of the top of the tibia and making sure the prosthesis is in good position. We're now proceeding on. The patient's leg, right leg, has been prepped. And we're allowing the liquids to dry on the knee. Care is made to ensure that the entire procedure is completed sterily. You can see the surgeon's initials on the knee to ensure that the correct knee is being done. These initials were applied while the patient is awake in the pre-op area. The Mako robotic surgery has been available for parts of the knee over 10 years. At BID Plymouth, we believed in the technology after a careful review of the surgery in 2012. The first Mako robot was obtained then, and we proceeded to have excellent results with partial knee replacements. I've now performed over 200 partial knee replacements with great results. A leg holder is being applied to the limb at this time. In order to ensure that there's no possibility of infection, what we do is everything possible. We carefully evaluate the patient before the surgery and ensure that uh, we've corrected as many things as we can. For example, no patient with any tooth abscess, for example, may have surgery. Patients are checked for bladder infections before the surgery. When the patient is, has a nasal culture obtained, that means that a swab is inserted into the nostrils, and a culture taken of the nose to check for the bacteria methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, otherwise known as MRSA. If a person is positive for MRSA, we change our antibiotic regimen to a medication called vancomycin. Typically, patients receive a pelicillin-like medication called ANCEF or cephalosporins. This medication is the best antibiotic to use for prevention of infection with knee replacements. The incision is prepared. One 
fingers breadth above the kneecap and three fingers breadth below the kneecap. You can see the surgical drape applied to the limb. The drape itself actually has iodine within it. After touching the skin, the uh, surgical team's gloves are all changed once again in order to decrease the chance of infection. To help out with post-operative pain, we inject the skin area with a long-acting Novocaine. This medication can last for 36 hours and provide numbness or decreased sensation right along the skin edges. In order to decrease the amount of bleeding from the surgery, a tourniquet has been applied to the upper thigh area. A leg holder is, places the knee in proper alignment. The incision is made with the knee flexed. This allows the tissues to easily open up for evaluation of the knee. The incision is continued down to the muscle envelope called fascia. The fascia is then opened sharply with a knife to allow exposure into the knee joint itself. Tools are inserted into the knee to allow for better exposure of the knee joint. These are called retractors. The tissue is elevated from the bone. In this case, the medial ligament is pulled medially or toward the inside. Another retractor is placed on the outside part of the knee. There's a fat pad called Hoffa's fat pad, which was removed during the procedure to allow for a complete exposure of the top of the shin bone. The shin bone is called the tibia. We now can see the ACL right there. The ACL in, in this procedure will be resected, removed. We will leave the posterior crucial ligament in place behind the ACL. There are some new knee replacements um, on the market which spare both the ACL and PCL. The results are still pending. We can see now the amount of wear within this uh, patient's knee. There's bare bone on the inside part of the knee and irregular surface defects on the remaining part of the knee. It is severely arthritic. Attention is now directed to the kneecap. The kneecap is pulled over. Uh, for complete exposure using the towel clips. Some of the soft tissue is removed for better visualization of the kneecap. The kneecap is measured and typically falls within a range of 14 millimeters to 28 millimeters. It's important to leave a minimum of 12 millimeters of uh, bone for the, knee, the patella. A special saw is removed. You can see that it is only end cutting. In other words, it doesn't oscillate to and fro. It just simply proceeds with the resection on the end. We check the depth of the cut or resection of the bone. Further resection is necessary until the surgeon is completely satisfied with the amount of bone remaining.
the true new kneecap will have three pegs in place. Three drill holes have to be applied at this point. This uh, device is placed directly in the middle or center of the uh, kneecap. Three drill holes are completed. Some of the bone spurs removed, some of the soft tissues removed around the remaining patella. A protective cap, metal cap, is applied to the patella and squeezed in the position to protect it during the procedure. Now we're preparing to insert the Mako arrays for the robotic surgery. The retractor is inserted. A small layer of tissue is removed from the end of the distal femur or the thigh bone. Two pins are inserted in the end of the thigh bone. A small checkpoint is also inserted. The surgery technician applies the Mako robotic array to the two pins in the distal femur. Two more pins are inserted into the top of the tibia or shin bone, along with a checkpoint. Another array is applied to the tibia. These are secured in position and mustn't move during the procedure. They'll now be giving information up to the computer, which is to our right across the operating room table. The knee is now moved about in circles. To make sure that we have a hip center in position. Now what we're doing is checking on the bones of the ankle. Now on top of the femur. Making sure the points are all good. A registration has to be accomplished at this point with real time between the CT scan that is seen on the right and the true knee on the left. Multiple small points are registered onto the image on the right to ensure perfect real-time um, procedure. Everything that you see, will see on the right, will actually uh, be seen visibly on the real knee itself.
We're now moving over to the top of the shin bone, the top of the tibia. Multiple point, points are also determined here by the surgeon working with the Mako product specialist. Now we proceed with so-called popping the bubbles. These are verification points, ensuring that um, what we have is true. You'll see some large spurs of bone. These are now being removed from the inside part of the knee with a sharp chisel called an osteotome, a curved osteotome. They are in turn removed by a rongeur. On the top of the shin bone, further bone spurs or osteophytes are removed as well. A soft tissue dissection is done with the osteotome around the corner of the knee. Now we can actually see real-time information off the CT scan as I proceed to stress the knee joint. A small tool is inserted inside the knee joint to really check out the so-called gaps, the gaps between the thigh bone and the shin bone. Ultimately, we'll end up having equal numbers here, both in the inside and the outside part of the knee, so that the 23 or the 18 will be seen as a 21 and 21. This must be done both with the knee fully extended or straight, and also with the knee at 90 degrees or bent. The various tools are inserted again to stretch out the knee to check out the gaps. In this case, the ligament, the MCL, is too tight. So under direct vision, we are loosening up the ligament on the inside part of the knee and having that 18-19 number possibly come looser to 20. Sometimes knees that have arthritis become contracted. We now see the 20. I found that using a knife sometimes is difficult and it's just simply easier to use a, a needle technique. We're checking out our gaps again by stretching out the knee. We now are getting 25-25. And now we flex the knee to 90 degrees or bend it. And we'll put the tools in again. We're trying to get our gaps equal on both sides. We put the tool on the inside now. And still a little bit tight, but not so much. 23-22. Bouncing around there a little bit but good enough. We'll finish it, this off with bone resections and make it perfect. This is the thought process part of the procedure. Now what we're determining is how to get all the numbers perfect. Try and get the various numbers to be equal. So what we're doing is working with the MPS, Mako's Product Specialist, 
and ensuring that we have appropriate cuts so that the, the knee will be a stable knee. So when the knee places through a range of motion, walking or going up and down stairs, there will be no artificial laxity of the knee joint. When we're satisfied with the computer generated numbers and gaps and bone resections, making sure that we don't take off too much bone, we then go back to a registration of the bone using the green, green probe. The robotic saw is placed in position. The robotic saw itself is registered. Now we'll be having real-time surgery here. The robotic saw will actually guide the surgeon's hand and place it in proper position. We can see the bone resection in the robotic arm is actually guiding the surgeon's hand. We can see this now over on the computer screen. All the green must be removed. The bone resection was done perfectly. We have to ensure that there's no damage to the soft tissues of the knee, otherwise known as the ligaments. The retractor is inserted. We can see the bone being resected. On both um, views. On the outside part of the knee, we're pulling over the kneecap tendon, otherwise known as the patella tendon and the saw is used for a perfect resection of the bone. We do have different sizes of the prosthesis. We have one through eight for the femur. We have one through eight for the tibia. You can see how the robotic arm moves right into position. We can now see how the robotic resection is being completed. Small red line there is noted. This just means that the bone resection was one millimeter deeper. And a robotic um, surgery prevents um, any excessive bone resection. We now go on to the top of the shin bone. It's registered along with the saw. Again, we worry about the tissues around the knee. The retractor is inserted. The robotic arm by itself moves in place as soon as the surgeon pulls the trigger. You can now see the resection. It's perfectly completed. Sometimes there are tight spaces and it takes a little bit longer. Sometimes the bone is incredibly hard because of the arthritis is called sclerotic bone. Sometimes it takes a little longer. It's best to get as much of the green color eliminated. The robotic arm just moves in position for the next side. We can see the retractor on your far left pulling over the kneecap tendon. You 
It can be a tight fit. Sometimes it takes a couple seconds to get it in the right position. Once we get it in a good position, we can just simply proceed with the resection. At this point, the uh, saw blade has to be changed from a head-on position to cutting the bone at 90 degrees. So the bone resections are now removed while the uh, saw blade is being prepared. We can see the nice clean surfaces of the bone resection noted. Five bone resections are necessary on the end of the thigh bone, the femur, and one on the uh, top of the shin bone. We're completing the last two resections on the uh, end of the uh, femur by the 90 degree saw blade. We can now see that it's set up in a different position than it was before. We again have to go through re registration. Again, the retractor is inserted. And the bone resection completed. Knee replacement has been around since 1969. So not really that long. The opportunity for people to have a great result from a knee replacement has possibly been around just for the last 20 to 30 years. The first patients who required knee replacements are those poor patients who had to diagnose with rheumatoid arthritis and were willing to try anything. Nowadays, we operate primarily on those patients with osteoarthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis can be stopped as a disease process by the rheumatologist using these strong biologic medications. The last two resections are completed. So all the bone resections now can be completed within a matter of minutes and be done with precise alignment. The robotic saw is now removed. Now what we have to do is continue cleanup procedure. We're now removing the remaining tissues around the knee so that we can now um, introduce the prosthesis. A large levering device called a Cobb elevator is inserted into the knee. This is holding top of the uh, shin bone or the tibia, pulling it forward. This is removed without problems. We note the posterior crucial ligament remains in place. A small spreading device is now inserted into the knee so that we can take a good look. We can see the PCL in the background there, posterior crucial ligament. Now the remaining meniscal tissue is removed from the medial or inside part of the knee joint. It's important to um, really visualize the top of the uh, tibia. This is the uh, remaining meniscal tissue. Meniscus is like a small rubber shim that's in the knee joint and it wears out and tears. 
and sometimes is resected when a person is younger. Bone spurs are noted around the posterior aspect of the knee, now removed. Um, they can um, limit the amount of flexion a patient has. So it's important to pull th these all out. There's remaining bone spurs along the edge here. These are all removed with a rongeur, ensuring a nice smooth edge. In order to decrease the patient's pain, Postoperatively, we do inject the entire knee with a solution of a long-acting Novocaine. This medication is called Exprel. Using this medication has been what they call a game changer, so it allows the patient to um, stand later today, walk down the hall, and move around. Keeping patients moving is our goal because it prevents leg clots and other problems. About 5 cc's of fluid is injected in various spots around the knee. The outside part of the knee on the lateral side or outside part of the knee is not injected because there's an important nerve there, which also can be numbed by the medicine. The spreading device is now inserted on the medial or inside part of the knee to allow better exposure of the lateral compartment. Some soft tissue is removed from the intercontinental notch just above the PCL. This is the remnants of the ACL. Now the uh, lateral meniscus could be visualized, pulled out using the uh, pituitary. It's a tight corner there, so sometimes it's a little bit difficult to remove all the meniscus tissue easily. Now it's removed. In the same manner, uh, some of the uh, posterior osteophytes or the bone spurs in the back of the knee are removed using the curved osteotome or chisel. And now fully removed with the uh, pituitary. Now the rongeur is used along the edge of the bone to ensure a nice smooth surface for the prosthesis. So we know what size we're using for the uh, femur. Now we have to double check the top of the tibia, the shin bone. The retractors are inserted perfectly in place so we can really see where our bone services is. Sharp dissection is used about the knee so that we really can see the top of it. Medial to lateral. The saw is used just to clean up edges to ensure a perfectly smooth surface.
So now we have the top of the tibia all set up, making sure we know exactly the edges. What we have to do is truly make sure that the prosthesis will sit on solid bone and not on a bone spur. In this case, there may be some bone spurs there along the edge of the tibia, so the curved osteotome is removed and some of the bone spurs are removed again. Like any foundation, you have to make sure the foundation is secure before proceeding with the next step of the construction. We have the retractor in there again, protecting the mediocleral ligament during the procedure. This behind the retractor. So with the two bent Holman retractors in place on the inside and the outside and the pickle fork in the back, we can see the entire top of the tibia. We're checking the size. As we discussed, we have eight sizes. The Mako CT scan review does de demonstrate uh, what size to use. We like to confirm it in vivo, however. Make sure it's the proper size. This is a trial on the femur, the uh, thigh bone. This is applied now. The true prosthesis will have some peg holes, uh, some pegs, and we're preparing the peg holes themselves. I like to make sure this is perfectly centered. It's necessary to be a perfectionist during this procedure to ensure a great result. These are the two holes for the pegs. This feels perfect here. This is removed. All right, now we put the uh, tibial tray in position with a insert tibial insert. We like to make sure this is in perfect position. Now we put the femoral trial in. Now we trial it. We see how it looks. I like to make sure we have a great result so far. We want to make sure that the metal doesn't overhang the bone. If that's the case, then it, the prosthesis has to be moved over. That can cause some rubbing of the tendons over the prosthesis is not helpful and can cause pain. This is just simply putting in some small pegs into the tibial tray so it doesn't move out of place. We're now checking for the extension or the way the knee straightens out. Make sure that's in good position. Now we're placing it through a range of motion. At the same time, we're looking at the uh, CT scan image, ensuring that it's a perfect alignment. At this time, feeling the knee, but also observing the CT scan of the image of the knee. We're getting all the sizes now from the, of the prosthesis. The knee lined up perfectly. All the um, instrumentation is now removed without problems.
Now what we have to do is remove the femoral trial and on the tibia component there is a keel it's called and we have to punch out the keel. The tower will be inserted next. Make sure that the tibial trial is perfectly on the top of the tibia. Small cyst is noted. This is the tower. The uh, punch is inserted. Since this is a larger size, we tap it down the next size up. This device is now removed along with the tibial tray. On the tibial prosthesis are also four pegs. This is in preparation of the four pegs. This is a small instrument. Now we place um, the uh, drill through these four drill holes. So it looks good. We can see the hardened bone on the medial side of the knee joint. There's a teeny little cyst there as well. This is cleaned out with a curette. We do take some bone from the previous bone resections and uh, push that in position in the cyst as a bone graft. Nice and smooth. Now we have the true prosthesis. We're tapping in place. You can see the little pegs fitting nicely into the top of the shin bone. And then patcher is then used to ensure that the prosthesis is in, in the bone. What will happen as time goes on is the bone will grow into the prosthesis. There's a little promise of the bone edge, and this is resected using the rangeur. So a white tibial insert is then in placed in position and tapped in place. So the tibia or shin bone side is completely completed. Now we're going up to the femur or thigh bone. We have the prosthesis there. We have a small cyst. Maybe we're going to put a little bit of bone in that cyst as well. Uh, now we have the prosthesis in place, tapped in position. Now we check our range of motion. We see the knee flexes very easily without any problems. Next step is the kneecap. We um, remove the protective metal cap. The prosthesis is inserted. This is the preliminary uh, tool to squeeze in position, followed by a more dramatic tool to really truly squeeze it into position tightly. And there it is. Looks perfect in place.
So it looks good, feels good, extends nicely. Has a good range of motion. The kneecap is staying in place. So we do have to worry about infection. We have to worry about infection quite a bit. We, um, as we noted, we uh, make sure patients are tested for MRSA. Uh, we give them appropriate antibiotics before the surgery, one hour within the surgery's time, so that the uh, antibiotic actually circulates through the whole body. At this point right now, we're washing it out with a betadine or iodine solution. and letting this uh, solution sit in the wound. This has been proven to be successful. You may remember talking about the fascia. The fascia is now closed with a heavy-duty suture. This heavy-duty suture has small barbs on it. You can see the irregularity of the suture. And as this is um, inserted into the fascia, it'll actually hold all the uh, tissues in place. So when a patient is bending their knee, they have, have no reason to worry about the knee coming apart or opening up. This is called closure of the knee. We also worry about um, leg clots. Leg clots can, can become lung clots. Lung clots can have a fatal result, although um, I've never had a fatal result from a lung clot. I do worry about all this. We uh, did use cumin in the past. Cumin is a very strong blood thinner. Since that time, probably 80% of our patients over the last five years have gone over to simply aspirin for those patients who are otherwise relatively healthy. So it's 81 milligrams, the baby aspirin, taken twice a day for six weeks. We um, have found that's been very successful in decreasing our chances of leg clots. Um, there are other medications available. Xeralto is one, and also Eliquis, and we're trying to figure out who gets what medication before we go too far. We know that cumin works. We know that probably these other medications work. Anticoagulants, unfortunately, also uh, cause extra bleeding because they stop you from clotting. So we're trying to figure out the best way to uh, evaluate a patient, particularly after hip replacements, whether or not we should use aspirin, Geralto, Eliquis, or Coumadin. And we'll figure it out with some time. Before the surgery, the patient had to be placed through a conservative management of knee arthritis. This includes the use of anti-inflammatory medications such as ibuprofen relief or stronger medication um, provided by a prescription by the physician. Or um, Tylenol, uh, ice is sometimes used. We recommend physical therapy. There are a host of various injections to use, either steroids or a visco supplementation, other known as a gel or chicken shots. What I find is that the injection of steroids helps for a period of time. They're supposed to work for four to six months. They can be repeated to a knee joint every four to six months as necessary. And we try that first. Some patients are candidates for the gel injection. The gel injection takes two months to work and also um, works only 50% of the time. So that's useful for some patients and not everyone.
most of our patients who see us want to be out of pain at that moment, so using the gel isn't always very successful. The other thing we recommend is weight reduction. And um, that's usually helpful for a patient as well, as well as getting them in shape for the surgery. You can see the hatch marks here. My physician assistant is now closing up the wound. And uh, ensuring that this is perfectly aligned to allow for good healing. On weight, we um, do have to be careful of uh, infection. Those patients who are overweight with a BMI of 40 or more have a possibility of infection 10 times higher than the normal patient. So it's important that they have a BMI of less than 40. Infected knee replacements are a true night terror for the surgeon and as well as the patient. It can be a disaster and take uh, months and even six months to a year to fully heal. Further surgery is necessary. Extensive antibiotics are necessary. It's just um, something which can be a disaster for a patient. Smokers, where uh, we don't operate on smokers either. All smokers must stop. When a patient smokes, they're filling their lungs up, not with oxygen, which is necessary for healing, but with smoke and all the various tar ingredients in cigarette smoke. So it's necessary to stop smoking to ensure appropriate healing and to um, ensure that um, we don't end up with an infection. As noted, four patients, four sets of patients do develop complications, diabetics, rheumatoids, smokers, and those patients who are overweight. So we try to take care of, of many variables as we can. For diabetics, we ensure that um, their A1C is less than 8.0 so that their diabetes is under control. We've actually canceled patients with BMI, uh, a A1C of 8.6, and uh, to ensure appropriate healing. This uh, patient will uh, proceed with physical therapy today, up walking down the hall, uh, discharge tomorrow. A special dressing room will be applied. It'll be waterproof, so they, she will be able to take a shower when she gets home tomorrow. The special dressing state is removed by the visiting nurses 10 days after surgery. We don't use stitches or staples. We simply use a form of um, superglue to close the wound. We find that it helps along with the type of suture material we're using. Physical therapy will be initiated at home. The patient will be encouraged to keep the limb elevated. We do provide a foam ramp to go home. It's like a pillow that just holds the leg in an elevated position to decrease the amount of swelling of the limb. We also provide an ice bucket, um, and this is very helpful in decreasing the swelling. We usually recommend the patients um, do their activities in the morning and keep the leg elevated during the afternoon. The uh, visiting nurses come in several times a week, along with the physical therapist. They're usually on different time schedules. The uh, physical therapist will advance the patient from a walker to a cane probably at four or five days after the surgery, if all is well. It seems to be the rare patient who is on um, a walker longer than a week. Pain medication is necessary. We do use Celebrex. Celebrex is a, uh, a type of anti-inflammatory medication similar to ibuprofen, except that it um, doesn't have the same stomach issues that ibuprofen has. In other words, you can take Celebrex and would have a limited opportunity to have a stomach ulcer or a bleeding ulcer from the stomach. 
Um, we also use tramadol, which is a mild pain medication. Um, it's a mild narcotic pain, pain medication, and to that part it is uh, followed by the uh, government. We do use uh, either Percocet, frequently oxycodone actually, um, which is the Percocet without the Tylenol. We do use Tylenol, we use Vicodin if we have to, if a patient uh, is unable to tolerate the side effects of Percocet or oxycodone. Typically the side effect of oxycodone or Percocet is uh, simply nausea. We um, uh, have the patient uh, continue with these medications for uh, several weeks. Most of our patients are simply using aspirin 81 milligrams twice daily for the uh, six-week period of time as a blood thinner. Um, at three weeks, they return to the orthopedic office for reevaluation. Uh, the uh, knee is inspected for satisfactory healing. Calf tenderness is evaluated to ensure no um, leg clot. Range of motion is tested of the knee joint itself to ensure that the patient is doing their exercises. And uh, lastly, an x-ray is taken to ensure appropriate um, position of the knee joint. We've been um, quite fortunate to note that the uh, Mako robotic surgery works very well and uh, is reliable in giving us a perfect alignment of the knee replacement in all cases. At the three-week mark, uh, when the patient is seen in the orthopedic office, we then proceed with a course of outpatient physical therapy. The patient may drive with the right knee surgery at four weeks and with left knee surgery at three weeks. Outpatient physical therapy is then accomplished. As we go along, we um, proceed with uh, the physical therapy. It takes up to a full year for the knee to fully recover. And, and in fact, it's been noted that the muscles about the knee take up to two years to fully recover. That being said, the first phase of recovery seems to be two to three months after surgery. For some people, it seems to be two months, and other people, three months to get back to your normal activities once again. Um, I do have patients concerned that their knee will open up after we uh, do the surgery when they bend it too far. And you'll notice with this suture material, it has uh, small barbs on it that help hold the uh, skin edges together. And um, again, this has worked great without any problems. Um, I do have some patients who have two knees. One, uh, the way we usually handle this is we don't do two surgery knees in one day. We find it's just too much. It's too much to recover from. What we do is um, the first knee is done at the same time that the first knee is done as steroid injection is provided for the second knee. It's safe to do proceed with a knee replacement for the second knee at three months since all the potential complications have been eliminated with uh, just simply time. But what we see in the orthopedic office is that people come back at the six-month to a year mark after their first surgery. There typically is no rush. We just want to ensure that this is the right thing to do for our patients so they can proceed with the second knee. It seems as if it takes that long sometimes for them to feel secure with the first knee so we can go to the second knee. The um, surgeries have been overall working great. We do have a couple of patients who uh, require manipulation. This is because of scar tissue. Scar tissue seems to happen more with diabetics. It seems to also happen with some people who are unable to take pain medication. And then sometimes it just happens. Um, this is, uh, should be considered just part of the physical therapy. And we'll loosen up the knee joint so the patient can um, have a quick response to this with their physical therapist. This would be done six to eight weeks after the first um, uh, surgery.
The uh, hip surgery is similar to the uh, knee. It seems to be a little bit faster. Those people who are significantly overweight seem to have more possibilities of infections. We've been extremely uh, fortunate with our knee replacements. We have minimal infections. They do occur, but again, usually only in the groups that we pointed out. Um, we do use the Mako. We found that um, it is a um, lifesaver. We started using computer navigation surgery in 2003 in an effort to differentiate us and our surgeries from Boston and actually became a firm believer in computer surgery. Um, we continue to do the computer surgery till December 2017. And... Um, at which time the robotic technology for a knee replacement really came up and uh, really worked. After reviewing it, we decided to start doing it here. Dr. Zabilski started doing it first, followed by Dr. Reitmeyer, and then I was last. And it seems like there's no question that these surgeries are provide uh, excellent results. It appears that there's less damage to the surrounding tissues, and that's actually been discovered by a recent papers, knowing that the patients appear to recover uh, faster. Uh, we're not doing as much um, pushing around the tissues as much. Um, we don't have to. The robotic arm doesn't require that you do a uh, large exposure. The use of the pins and the pins array within the incision is an off-label use, but we found that it works and uh, should be okayed by uh, the uh, uh, various licensing agencies. We can see that the PA is doing an excellent job on the uh, subtanous tissue. You may notice that we keep the knee flexed and um, uh, bent in 90 degrees of flexion. This is to um, decrease the chances of having a stiff knee after the operation. This seems to be of definite benefit for the patient. We've been doing a pathway every month for, since 1995. We meet together with uh, pharmacists, anesthesiologists, nurses from all levels, from the pre-admission testing, PAT, to the pre-op nurses, to the operating room nurses, and techs, to the floor nurses, the VNAs, and lastly, the rehabs. Um, this also includes the therapists, both physical and occupational therapists, making sure they're all on board with our procedure and make sure they have no questions. So once a month we ensure that we um, have a great product. We review those patients who may have had some difficulties and um, ensure that we don't have that uh, problem arise again. We have an excellent program and this is the reason why we have a buy-in from all different levels of uh, people. We're looking forward to obtaining the Joint Commission Certification of Excellence for Hip and Knee Replacements. We're working on that right now. And um, that looks like it should be uh, obtained by the end of this year, 2019. Um, we hope to obtain the advanced level um, soon as well, um, rapidly after the first certification. We have a lot of passionate staff members who are very helpful to our program. We've been doing great. And I'd like to thank them all for uh, being such a great part of our, our program. We start off with uh, Kareen Mahoney, my physician assistant, who's just closed the wound. Jessica Abbott, who has been her technician at the moment. Dave McKenzie, who was uh, the assistant during the procedure, along with uh, Kareen. 
Uh, Stephanie Hurley is a circuit lane nurse walking about the uh, room along with Amy Ayers, who is our team leader for orthopedics in the operating room. On the uh, floors, we have uh, uh, so many nurses, and I'm afraid to forget someone, but Candy, Christine, Joanne, Judy, uh, Jean, Laurel, Lindsay, Allison, Gary. I mean, they, we have all these great nurses on the floor that um, James, Robert, Eric, uh, who are so helpful to uh, our assistant, assisting our patients um, to uh, um, better health. Uh, for our community hospitals, we have a unique product that seems to be really uh, helpful to everyone. We take care of friends and neighbors and um, everyone around the the community. We're fortunate that we can help out so many patients in the southeastern Massachusetts community. We've had a lot of help from administration. They've actually purchased two MAKO robotics devices. I'd like to thank them for that, too. They're about a million dollars each, and so we can really... Uh, provide excellent care. Thanks.